Welcome back, everyone. I'm Kai Carrington Russell, Australian award winning author of contemporary romance and kick butt heroines and dark fantasy worlds. And I have a very special guest for you today. We are talking to a USA Today best selling author known for her dark, mysterious, sexy, and passionate romance. Known for books such as The Dalton Family and the Agency series, we are talking to the one and only Marnie Mard. How are you today? I'm good, thank you. You're so sweet. What an introduction. <laughs> it's a lot to uh to memorize because you you've accomplished so much. I mean, from an outside perspective. So I'm really excited to deep dive because I imagine not all of it felt like a huge success and certainly not straight away. So I'm really excited to hear about your journey. So take me back to the start. Why did you start writing and how was publishing for the first time? Oh my gosh. I feel like that was a whole lifetime ago. Um, my goal was to publish my first book when I, by the time I was 30 and that basically happened. So we're going back like 2000, six, 2007. I've always, always been a writer my whole life. Went to school, went to college for writing. And I worked in advertising at the time and I was miserable and I just wanted to write books. And so I thought that I was Carrie Bradshaw from Sex in the City. And I was living in downtown Boston and I was like, okay, I'm going to write Chiclet because that is what Carrie Bradshaw would write. And so it just didn't stick. Nothing felt right. And then I lost a really, really dear friend of mine to a drug overdose and it wrecked me, like completely wrecked me. And so I knew what addiction looked like from being a best friend point of view, but I didn't know what it looked like from the attic because we, we lived in different States. We were in different places in our lives. So I hit the streets and I interviewed addicts while they were shooting up. And I learned absolutely everything I could about heroin. And I wrote two books based on addiction and I got a publishing deal. And this is going back. Um, those two books were published in 2011. And as I published those books, my publisher at the time was like, you know, there's sex in those books. You really have a knack for writing sex. Fifty Shades of Grey is like taking off. Would you ever consider writing erotica? And I'm like, sure, I can write erotica. And I started writing erotica and then it all turned into this. <laughs> wow, that is that is such a powerful start to your journey, especially when you started with Chiclet and then you went into something so heavy but meaningful. I imagine that would have been a very, I want to say, healing process as well when you were writing those two books. It was. It was the only way that I could really get over her and not in the sense where, I mean, she's still in my life. I still feel her every single day, but it was therapeutic. It was my goodbye to her. It was and it, it was what she passed away from was an entirely different drug than heroin. I wanted those two worlds to be separate. I didn't want this to be her story. I wanted this to be my story. And so she just, she inspired the pain. And so I was able to get the closure I needed because I wasn't able to say goodbye. And that was the biggest thing for me. And how did you feel then going into erotica? Because as you said, when um, when Fifty Shades came out, just went boom and everyone was going crazy for it. But there was still a lot of taboo around it as well. There was still a lot of those conversations like, oh, is this, is this too much? Is it not enough? And it really widened the audience for that genre. So how did you feel first being one of the first ones to, well, not the first ones, should I say, but stepping into that genre that was still controversial I want to say I feel like I've always been on the controversial side um to be honest you know my first two books I, I got rejected by a lot of publishers and a lot of agents they were like it's just too dark we can't publish this it's just it's too taboo so I almost like those two books almost prepped me for like the the veil that I had to take off in order to do romance and erotica and I'm the type of person that when I'm given a challenge I go all in it I you know, I don't just dip my toes in, I dive straight into the pool. And so I said, if I'm going to do erotica, I'm, they're going to get it as raw and honest. And my writing is extremely detailed. My sex scenes are very long. You know where his tongue is at all moments. So I, I, I didn't care. I just said, okay, we're going to do this. And I didn't know then that it would turn into this now. And I wrote under my Marnie Mann is my real name. And so I didn't even use a pen name. And then things started happening. And so I'm like, oh gosh, did I make a mistake? But you know, I didn't, this is who I am. And I'm, I, I don't apologize for what I write and I know it's not for everyone and that's okay. So what year was the first book published in? 2011. 
so how did you go then? Do you independently publishers now uh, now as well? Are you a hybrid or how how did that start forming for you? When did you really start noticing that, oh, I'm an author, I have a readership, there's a demand? So I stayed with my publisher for probably seven or eight books. And then self-publishing was just booming at the time. And I think the reason I stayed so long with my publisher, one of the reasons is I was terrified to make the leap, you know, being your own boss. And it, it's not just, and this is probably something we'll talk about later, but it's not just sitting down and writing a book. It's running a business. And I don't think at that time I was ready and prepared for that level of business ship. And so for me, working with a publisher was just easier. And then I decided to take the leap. It was time. I wanted to make more money. I wanted to have more control. I wanted it. I wanted what I wanted on the cover, you know? And so I, my husband is, is, pure business. And so I was like, all right, we're going to do this together. And he has his own thing. I mean, he works his own job and I have this, but he is heavily, heavily involved in all aspects of my business. And so we did it together and we, we built this business and he was just fabulous and all business decisions, because I really just want to be the writing person. I don't want to make all the decisions. So, um, I made the leap into self-publishing and then, I was self-published for all those years. And then I went to my agent and I said, okay, next goal. I, I want to be traditionally published. I want to walk through an airport and see my book in the bookstore. Like that's all, that's all I want. And so I, um, I wrote a book. I actually wrote two books and we pitched them all over and they were just purchased by Montlake. So the first one is actually being published in October. Um, and that dream came true. Like I'm so blessed. So I guess I'm hybrid at this point. Um, yeah. <laughs> I love too that you mentioned though, that goals do shift. As you said, first published in 2011, you've been doing this for over a decade, which is incredible. And so I imagine you would have seen a lot of the industry over that time change, and then we have to adapt with it. And as you said, as a business you also have to pivot a lot because, you know, there's there's new trends, there's new hypes. That's that's fallen down. We can't use that. Whatever it may be, we're always pivoting. But then also we change as well as individuals and as authors and our goals change too. So I, I'm so glad that you mentioned it. What would you say in that over a decade time, which is still I love saying that because it's just it's such a staple piece too. It's not necessarily the achievements that you make, but once you get past that 10 years, it's like, wow. I've been doing this for a really long like I've been able to stay relevant I've been able to remain uh, focused on it because I know there were probably many times where you thought is this really what I want to do this is really really hard so what are some of the conversations that you've had with yourself in the past when you were having moments like that you were having moments of doubt oh gosh I mean this business there's so many highs and lows and I I always emphasize that when I talk to new writers who are looking to get into the field, there's, it's, it's never going to be a consistent high. You don't ever compare your current book to your last book, your, this series to your last series. There's changes in the industry. There's changes in the buyer market. I mean, I remember when KU was first launched and what that looked like. I started off wide. I went into KU. I went back to wide. I went back to KU. I mean, there's just in the buying phases of readers that's changed so much. I remember when Kobo first hit the market, like, you know, there, <laughs> when you say a decade, it's, it's wild to think of all the different things that me and, and all of us have seen, you know, throughout all these years. The biggest thing is that I love writing and I don't think that I would be me if I wasn't able to write. And so that's been the biggest thing for me, no matter what, you just have to sit down every single day and you have to write and the readers will either love you or they'll hate you. And that is okay. You cannot please everyone. And that is something that you have to learn from the very beginning. But if you just keep writing and you constantly have a product to sell, then you can kind of stay where you need to be. If that makes sense, you know, you, people quickly forget about you if you don't have a product. So you just have to keep developing a product. 100%. So I've now been doing this for, oh, I just realized actually it's my anniversary month. I'm like, oh, I better do something for that. So nine years now. So, and 
as you were saying, it changes so much. And I think one thing that I notice I really um, gets to a lot of authors is when you go in, you have big doe eyes, you've got the sparkle and the dream and you just want to write, as you said. And then when the impact of it becoming a business really comes into it, I think, you know, you get to about a year or two in, you've been writing crazily and then you think, oh, I need to implement all of these things. So what would be your advice? And it's been fantastic that you've had that support from your husband as well, because it's so hard to learn all of this stuff. And a lot of the time we can't manage it all on our own as well. What would be your advice when prioritizing things? Like what does your nine to five look like for you? So you can still focus on writing and then add these things in as well, but healthily. I'm a perfectionist and I'm a control freak when it comes to my job. Two horrible, horrible traits to have when you're a business owner and you are solo. So the biggest thing I learned over all these years is to ask for help and to get help and to delegate. You cannot control when this turns into, when it starts as a hobby and then it turns into a business, you can't control all aspects of it. There's just not enough hours in the day. And even if you work at four o'clock in the morning to one o'clock in the morning, which I've done on many occasions, you still can't get it all done. So when you can afford to do it and when you can expand to the point where you can ask for help, um, it's time to do so. And you have to find people who you can really trust. And that's another really big thing. I mean, my team who I've worked with for years and years and years now, like I tell them everything, you know, there's transparency between us. They know all my plots. They know all my twists. They know everything that's happening in my book world. And so you just have to surround yourself with people you can truly trust and delegate, delegate, delegate. You, you can't do it all. No. And I'm curious, you don't have to give an example, but I am assuming like most people, there have been relationships that you haven't necessarily had work out. I want to say business relationships in the sense that you're like, okay, this looks like a fantastic opportunity. And then you get about six months in or so and you think, actually, we're not necessarily compatible and that's completely okay as well. So have you have you had that kind of experience during your career? I have. I've used, um, I had two publicists before my, my current publicist and you know, we just weren't on the same page about things. We weren't necessarily, she wasn't helping me grow the way I wanted to. Um, and then I, I was actually at a book signing and I saw this publicist walking down the aisle, speaking to other authors. And I said to my best friend who was assisting me, I had laryngitis at the book signing. I could not say a word. Like no one could hear me. She had to do all the talking for me. It was terrible. And so I whispered to her, I was like, one day when I'm big enough, I'm going to have her as my publicist. Like she's my dream team member. And I reached out to her like a year later and begged her to work with me. And she did. And I've had her ever since, but it took me a really long time. It took over half my career to to get to the place where she would take me on. And so, yes, there's been people on my team who haven't worked out. I've had, um, I had an assistant prior to the one that, you know, I have now and things just didn't work out. We weren't on the same page and that's okay. You know, it's really hard working with friends. I've also learned that the hard way. You really want the people who are on your team to not be your besties because it's just, it's hard. And you have to treat this like it's a business because it hundred percent is, this isn't just like, you know, a fun hobby. This isn't just, you know, these are machines that we're running. I mean, businesses are machines and you have to have the right people in the right roles. So what does your, your day to day look like then? Do you, and also I'm curious about your writing. We've talked about that a little bit later, like you're plotting, a, um, whether you're a plotter or a pencil, but how do you structure your day or is there no structure? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm very structured. <laughs> in I all think things. That's from the conversation we were having. <laughs> <laughs> in all ways in my life, I'm structured. Um, I it depends. If I'm on deadline, I probably get up at 3 30 or 4 in the morning. I get my best work done like before everyone's awake. My husband, like I said, also works from home. His job is very loud. He's on the phone all day. So my office is upstairs. I can still hear him, but it gives me like four or five hours before I hear my name being called out in the house, which is huge. So I get up really early and I am in complete darkness and I get in a good 2000 words. And then I start with like the admin stuff that I have to get in during the day and like scheduling social media stuff and like talking to my team and participating in meetings or whatever needs to be done. And then I typically go back to writing 
and try to get another thousand words in. And then I would love to end my day between four and five, but lately it's been more of like, I worked until one o'clock this morning, yesterday, well, this morning. So it's just been, a, deadlines have been kind of rough lately. I just have to kind of get through this hump, but I would really like to end my day at like five. <laughs> Do you work on multiple projects at once or one at a time? So I don't, but I am right now. <laughs> uh, my Montlake book, like I said, is coming out in October and we're in the middle of copy edits right now. So I'm editing one book that's coming out in June. I'm doing copy edits on that book. And then I just submitted The Bachelor, which is coming out April 27th to my editor. And she's going to be coming back with edits in a week or so. So I'm probably going to be working on three books at once, which I never do. I need one voice in my head and that's it. But this hump that I'm in right now is I just have to get through it. So this is also a really <laughs> tiring, but incredible experience as well. So I am curious, how are you finding the process with Montlake? Because I've now interviewed a couple of Montlake authors and I also uh, interviewed the editor of Montlake as well, who's super, super sweet. And everyone that I have spoken to were really, really impressed by the process. And now that you're kind of like in the midst of it, um, I'm curious as to how you're finding it as well. I really love it. It's so different than my process. I mean, in every way, shape or form from the editing to the cover design to their strategy, the marketing strategy. Um, I just reviewed, so I got my copy edits actually back today and I was reviewing them and it just, you know, I have a 16 page style sheet, which is like everything that's part of my book. So they go over like timelines, characters, like what the characters look like, all the proper nouns that I use. And these are things that like my team, we don't include, like, I don't have a style sheet when I get, you know, cause we don't need one. So it's, it's been very different. Um, they're so thorough and just like super kind and they really, really care about our opinion, which is really nice. I was really worried about going on the, tra you know, traditional side and having no voice. And that's the last thing they want. They don't want to take away your voice. And they emphasize that from the beginning. So I feel like I've found a home with Montlake. I hope they love me as much as I love them. <laughs> they do. Well, you write incredible books. So I feel like it's a match made in heaven already. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Of incredible books. I want to talk about your recent release, The Bachelor, because that cover is hot. Um, and for those who haven't yet read it, and they should, can you tell us a little bit about what it's about and the inspiration behind it? So sadly, it's the fifth and final book in the Dalton Family series, which is gut-wrenching to me because I've loved this series. I feel like I've birthed these boys, as weird as that sounds. Like I just, they've been like my family for the past year or so that I've been working on it. So, um, Cam this book, the bachelor Camden is the youngest of, of the family. He's 25 when the book starts and he is a twin. And so his twin sister, Hannah, she was the previous book, which was the intern. And so he's falling in love with her best friend and her best friend is also 25. They've been friends since they were 12 years old and she happens to be a virgin. I've never written the best friend's sibling. I've never written a virgin heroine before. This is all very new to me and not to like call myself out, but I've been with my husband since I was 19 years old and it's been a long time. Like I don't remember all that. So writing a virgin heroine was just like very interesting. So um, it's been really fun. It's this book is very erotic probably more so than the others in the series. Um, he's grumpy, grumpy, and she is just a ray of sunshine and they're just a really cool match. And it was so fun to write. And he doesn't just take a virginity. There's like steps involved in lots of foreplay and um, lessons to be learned. And it's what's cool about this book is that it spans a little bit of time. So you're able to really see like the build of their relationship and vulnerable moments and, you know, things that I necessarily couldn't include in the other books. So it's been really fun and sad at the same time because it's the last one. So, oh, you've just like rattled off some of my favorite tropes. Like, I'm just like, oh, and grumpy sunshine, tell me more. <laughs> How then, what does your writing process look like? Are you um, a plotter or a pantser? Is there anything that you have to put in place before you write? I don't know. Do you have to light a candle or sing Kamboya? I, I don't know. What's your process? I know a lot of writers do that. They're yeah. very, yeah. Uh, no, I, none of that. Um, 
I just need quiet. Like, and it's funny when I'm writing, I need loud music. And when I'm editing, I need quiet, quiet. That's pretty much my only requirements. Um, I am both, I am a plotter and a pantser. So it just depends on the type of style of book. I've written all different shades of romance. My angsty books are typically very, very twisty. Um, it takes a lot of development and a lot of sprinkling of nuggets to get those twists perfected within the plot. So in those types of books, um, I plot like crazy. I have every single chapter outlined. I know where it's going from beginning to end. There's no questions in my mind. With the Dalton Family series or my more erotic books, um, I pants the whole thing. I pretty much know what needs to be done because I've set up things, you know, like this is the fifth book. So I had, I set things up where this couple had to get together. Um, I go into the series knowing the tropes and who the hero and heroine are going to be for all of them. But for the plot, I kind of just like, let, let the book take me. So I do, do both. <laughs> it's going to be super hard. Do you have a particular favorite genre? <laughs> yes, it is hard. Um, yes. And it's also hard. I do. I would say, you know, love triangles get a lot of hate. They really do. Um, but I've written two. And one of them is an untraditional love triangle. And one of them is a flat out cheating book. And they were my most favorites to write only because I, I think it's just because I've been with my husband for so long and I, he's like my soulmate. And so it's so fascinating to me to just like see the other side of that and what it's the whole psychological element of being with someone you love, but being able to be touched by somebody else and how you can separate love physically and emotionally. And so for me, it is the same thing, but for my characters, it is not the same thing. And so I really love love triangles and I love to read them also. Oh, I love, that's a good answer. No, <laughs> not that right or wrong, but I'm like, yeah, I could see that. Wow. What then is, what is your advice for fellow writers that are listening right now to writing delicious romance? Are there any things that they should definitely make sure that they have or when it comes to the flow or any resources that you'd recommend taking up? Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um, so I know a lot of romance writers are not detailed. I know that some of their sex scenes are three paragraphs wrong three paragraphs long and that's not wrong um and that's, it's not long enough <laughs> and, and some readers enjoy that you know and some readers just need that taste and it satisfies them and that's perfect for me though even in my real life i need detail i need all the blanks to be filled in if you're starting to tell me a story i'm going to interrupt you six times and ask you what about this what about this it's just the way my brain works i have to fill in all the gaps so when it comes to sex scenes, I'm the same way. The biggest thing for me is I visualize the scene first in my mind. So the previous day, I probably am going to take a shower at some point, hopefully. And in the shower, or if I'm driving, or if I'm just laying in bed waiting to fall asleep, those are the moments where I visualize the scene. I see it from beginning to end. Then I sit down and I write it. I start from the moment he touches her to the moment he gets up or she gets up from bed or wherever in an alley or on the kitchen table, wherever it happens to take place. Um, another thing that really, really helps is if you write out loud, um, at least for me, hearing my words as aside from just seeing them helps with the flow of all scenes. So I edit out loud always and hearing sort of what that scene sounds like really, really, really helps. If it's clunky, if there's too much air involved, if it needs more, you know, sometimes you just don't always need to hear about this hand and this hand and the placement and the movement. Sometimes just having it flow in a different way really helps. So say it out loud and see what it hears, hear what it sounds like um, and kind of go from there. Have you ever considered trying dictation? I've tried it <laughs> and I, you would think that it would save me so much time. And I'm typically a kind of a fast writer. It doesn't work for me because I have to visualize the words too. I'm like, a, you know, there's people who need to see things and there's people who need to hear things. And I need like the full picture. I need both. So 
I wish that I could do that. I honestly feel like I could write a book in a day if that would be the case, because I would just zip through it, but I can't. Out of curiosity, averagely, how quickly do you write your books? From start to finish, about seven to eight weeks. Okay, that's really impressive. Wow. Oh, my first book took five years. So (laughs) I've come a long way. (laughs) But then again, that's, you know, obviously experience too. You understand your flow, you understand your voice, you understand when something is not feeling right. Have you ever experienced burnout? And what are the things that you do to prevent it from happening again? So in 2020, um, in the thick of COVID, I experienced the worst burnout of my career. I could not write. Um, I am a wanderlust. I am obsessed with traveling. I am fulfilled by nature, outdoorsy stuff, different cultures, textures. I need to be placed in different environments constantly. And COVID was just really hard on everybody, you know, Um, but it was hard on my writing soul because staying at home is just not my thing. And so not being able to travel or go anywhere was just, it, it, it sucked all the creativity out of me. And I only released one book that year. Ironically, it was a cheating book. Um, (laughs) and the book was based in London and Amsterdam. And that's, it just shows like, I'm such a mood writer and it just shows like where I was in my life. Like I just wanted to be out. And so, um, and I don't mean that in like any disrespect when it comes to like what happened to our country and nation or anything like that. We all felt that way. I know I'm no exception. Um, but when it comes to writing, that's just really my process. And so my husband and I, we don't have any children and we, which gives us a ton of flexibility to be able to, and he also works from home. So we can just pack up our things and visit places and travel and do all those types of things. And so all the places in my books I visited, all the, all the places I write about I've experienced. So I am constantly on the hunt for new experiences that I can include in my books and that inspire this creativity. And so that's the biggest thing for me. I want to touch on this a little bit because I, I completely relate to this. I'm very much the same massive traveler. I was living in Edinburgh before COVID came back to Australia to home and then lockdown. And so I, as terrible as it was in your own, everyone was impacted differently. But as creatives, it's interesting because some people were able to write 20 million books within those, like within that year or two. And then when you were one of those ones that was taking a massive impact because you do, you need that, I want to say, stimulation outside. You know, that's why we we get our inspiration. It feeds our soul. And then when you hear that and, you know, you're happy for them, but when you hear your friends writing 20 books and you can't it kind of plays on your mental health during that period too I'm wondering if you were experiencing the same not comparison itis but going why can't I work differently what you know how can I get up get over this but it's just the natural process and who we are so it just goes to show that how we are in our personal life impacts our productivity and our book life as well 100 percent and then it I was probably in the worst mental health place I've ever been in my life, you know, and then it's the fear of, will it ever come back? Will I ever be able to find that flow again? Because with writing, it's really, at least for me, it's a rhythm. Once I pause that rhythm and I take a break, whether it be to travel or I have the flu or some, some reason that I can't write, it takes me a minute to find that flow again. And sometimes it comes back just like it was before. Sometimes it needs coddling because it doesn't come back the way it was before. And so, you know, you're sitting there and you're, you're watching the whole world fall apart. People you love are dying and people you love are getting sick and you're watching the news and everything is dreadful. And there's just no light at the end of the tunnel. And you're sitting there wondering, what if I can't ever write again? What if this flow never comes back? What if, you know, everything that we've built all these years is gone. You know, what if I have to change my whole career and like refocus and find something else because this doesn't work. And so it was a really scary time for, you know, everybody. And that's my brain. That's where I was going. That's what I could not stop focusing on. And then you got a contract with mom, like the end. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And then that happened. Yeah. (laughs) It worked out. Thank goodness it worked out. Yeah. That's so good though. And I, I do, I 
I really like to discuss mental health on here as well because I think it's so important, especially in the industry that we work in, that we voice it a lot more and normalise it as well because it can be a very overwhelming and stressful environment and especially when a lot of the time we're doing it on our own, you know, we're in our in our room and we're writing and we're just thinking, why not me? Why haven't I finished this in time? Why am I diff- Why is my writing, you know, different? Why is it faster? Why is it slower? And I think that having these conversations really normalise that it's okay and just take a breath, take a break, and then come back to it. I'm curious, when you found out you're on the USA Today but, um, list, which is an incredible feat, I would love to know when you found out you're on that list and most importantly how you celebrated. But I'm also curious if there was something that was more sentimental to you when it came to recognition. I can't take personal credit for making that list. It was due to an anthology. So it wasn't a solo book of mine. Um, I was, I teamed up with a bunch of friends and we did a anthology and I actually ironically wrote a, a novella and I am now tearing that novella apart presently, which is titled dominated, which is going to come out in June. Um, I'm tearing it apart. I'm rewriting the whole thing. I'm adding 20,000 words to it. So it's entirely different, but just ironically, timing wise, um, the book I'm working on now is the book that was part of that anthology. Um, we did not know that we were going to hit. We had no idea. And um, Nikki Sloan happened to be, who's a fabulous, fabulous person and writer. She was the head of the anthology and she came into our group and she's like, you know, guys, I think we're very close. I, I think, I think we have enough sales to do it. And so, um, this is quite a few years ago. Those sales numbers have changed entirely, you know, and it changes every year. And now USA doesn't even have a bestsellers list. So everything is different now. Again, one of the things that we've seen come and go across the last decade, which is really sad because that was an amazing list. Um, so when the list came out, um, it, it was pretty emotional. I have to say like, for sure, that's been one of my goals from the very beginning. Um, you know, she posted in the group and we all got to view the list. We, we all went on the website and saw our names and it was really, really emotional, I would say. And then, um, I was talking to my publicist and she's like, you know, you can now add that to your covers. And I'm just like, oh gosh, it's just, it's one of those things at the very beginning where it doesn't seem like it's possible, you know, like at the very beginning, you know, can you make this a full-time job? That doesn't even seem possible. You know, can you get a backlist? Cause how long does that take? How many books do you have to write? Doesn't seem possible. Will you have audiobooks? Because way back then, back in 2011, audiobooks were like barely a thing. You know, there's just so many moments that have happened throughout my career. And everyone has come with I I'm a big celebrator. So I I think everything deserves to be celebrated. You know, all we have is moments and memories. And so I want to cherish each one. This career has it. All careers are difficult, but this one is, it's just been, it's hard. That's incredible. So what did you do to celebrate being on the USA Today list? I'm sure I dragged my hubby out for sushi because that is my go-to for all things. So um, I'm sure we did. Yeah. (laughs) So I love that you're such a big celebrator too, because so many authors that I speak to are like, um... Yeah, like I'm always just focusing on the next thing, so I don't really celebrate it. And I think, no, we really have to embrace the moments because we're so far ahead in scheduling and planning and, you know, what's doing this that we're already stressing out about the next book that we just have to take a moment to really appreciate what we've created and what we've done. So everyone, be more like Marnie. (laughs) That's my disclaimer. It's very important. Like I really, and birthdays too, you know, I came from a family who wasn't big celebrators. You know, my parents didn't decorate for holidays. It just wasn't our thing. You know, like we never had a Christmas tree. It just wasn't, I know that sounds so odd when I say that out loud, but it just wasn't our thing. My mom was just not a decorator. And so I, I I don't decorate for Christmas either in our house. And like, I don't have Easter eggs out. And I, part of that probably is because I was an only child and also we don't have children. So, you know, you don't get that excitement of like decorating for your kids and stuff, but one of the things that I learned, and I always think that you learn things from your parents that you want to do differently, you know, when you get to be an adult, even though I don't feel like I'm an adult, but um, age wise, I'm pretty sure I'm an adult at this point. I, it's all about celebrating. And so I might not have the decorations in my house, but we surely celebrate Christmas. And, you know, I always have 
I'm always under deadline for the next book. I'm always planning for the future, but I, I'm a hardcore believer that we have to celebrate what's happening in the moment. And all those milestones matter. I'm going to talk about a tricky beast here. Marketing. Yay. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Three of your top tips for fellow um, authors when it comes to marketing. What have you found works for you? Oh gosh. Marketing is a beast. Okay. Marketing and social media, the two of them are, it's like, it's animals that you don't even realize how large those animals are until you try to tackle them. Um, for me, it has been, I guess, marketing and, and social media for me go hand in hand, to be honest. I really focus on social media. Um, I spend a lot of time. My main focus is Instagram. I spend a lot of time on Instagram. It's just where I found my biggest connections as far as relationships that I've developed with these readers and their genuine relationships. I know when their cat is sick. I know when they're going in for surgery and I care and I want to know. And these readers who I've, they're part of my life and I've befriended these women and I've been blessed enough to have them in my life. And so I spend, if I'm going to spend any time on social media, it's going to be on Instagram and my Facebook group. I spend a lot of time in there too. Um, but mostly honestly, Instagram, I think cultivating these relationships, I think that, um, finding your true readership, I think that developing a really successful newsletter Um, finding a PR company that understands your goals, where you want to be, who your, who your voice is. Those are all really, really important things. Um, there's always, you know, advertising that's always a part of it too. That's another beast. (laughs) Um, but marketing is a lot of, for me, at least it's been word of mouth and it's one thing to just like have your face on the back cover of your book, but it's a whole other thing to put your face out there. And I think that's one of the most important things. I'm not one that's always going to post selfies. I hardly post any, but I'm going to reply to your comments and I'm going to reach out through DM and I'm going to ask how your day is. And I don't want to just talk about me. I want to talk about you too. And I think those things are really important. I think this really highlights again that I think sometimes we get so caught up in the in the stats and the numbers and how many followers can I have that we disconnect sometimes that it's readers on the other side that, you know, the reason why we're actually doing this in the first place is to connect. And so I think it's such, especially with TikTok coming into play the last couple of years, which is another thing that changed the um you know, change the terrain is that, you know, like how many views can it get? How many, we get so caught up in that and put that pressure on ourselves. Whereas sometimes we might be overlooking the fact that people are reaching out to us and we've kind of, we've missed it, if that makes sense. So I I see a lot of that at the moment, but also the good thing is, is I feel like people just go through phases and then they think they come back to their why, why am I doing this again? Why is this important for me to do? Because some people can spend a lot of hours every week on social media as well. Endless hours. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It, it's, you know, as your following grows, it takes more time. And I don't think people necessarily understand what it looks like on the other end. You know, um, I get help with my Facebook page. It's just something that I cannot manage. I, I can't manage it all. You know, we talked about delegating. It's one of the things that I had to delegate. Um, I have an ARC team and I have full help with my ARC team. It's just something I cannot manage on my own. So I think, I think what they're, one of the biggest misconceptions of writing is that we're just these people who sit in offices and just type away all day. And I wish that part of me wishes that that was the case because I feel like I would get so much done if that was the case. But honestly, writing is probably only 50% of my day, maybe even less, to be honest. I know it might, like at the moment for me, it's like 20% at the moment, which is terrible, but you just, there's so many other things happening just to keep it all or make yourself feel like you're floating, you're you're, you're thriving and surviving. (laughs) It's such a good point that exactly what you said, you described it perfectly. What what is the name of your Facebook group as well while we're at it? It's Marnie's Midnighters. Oh, I like that. (laughs) (laughs) One of my friends from forever ago who I, um, he, he was part of my publishing company 
not my publisher, the publisher that I signed with way back in 2011, he picked the name and this was going back over 10 years ago. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. Marnie's Midnighters does work really well. So it's got such a good ring to it. It does. (laughs) I can't take credit for it. I wish I could. (laughs) So overall, uh, what do we say? It's about 12 years. We've been doing this 12 years now. What would you say your greatest challenge and your greatest accomplishment has been so far? Oh boy. Um, I've had some really, really incredible moments, you know, like at book signings where I've been blessed to meet some of my readers and I, they tell me how my books affect them. And I cry with them because I'm emotional. And, you know, my first two books, my books about addiction, um, hits home for a lot of people. And so I hear a lot of stories. You know, I also first, I have a face where people, when they meet me, they tell me everything. And it's like that in, in always, like my whole life, people just unload to me, which I love, but I'm like, I'm an author. Like, I just want to preface that and say, everything is off. It's, you know, you may find yourself in a book one day. Um, no, I, w- I would never do that, oh, but I, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> um, that's been amazing to to have people wrap their arms around me and tell me how my books affected them. Those have definitely been some of the most incredible moments. I was the very beginning of my career. I Rosie O'Donnell reached out to me and she had read um, my first book. Her daughter um, was a heroin addict and she thought that I was the main lead in my book. And so she thought that it was a memoir because I titled the book memoirs aren't fairy tales, you know, cause I thought I was all cool in the marketing. So they, she assumed like most people assume that it's a memoir, although it's not. So Rosie O'Donnell reached out and we had multiple conversations and she actually came to the town that I live in. Cause ironically, she happened to own a home here and I got to meet her. And that was really, really, really cool. Just, you know, having a celebrity read your book and talk to you about it and her to get personal with me, which I'm not, you know, I'm not sharing anything she hasn't shared publicly. Everyone knows that her daughter, Hannah has had a addiction. So, um, it was pretty, pretty cool. So, um, you asked about the lowest moment. Um, I would say COVID that was probably when we talked about the mental health and not being able to write, that was probably some of the hardest also, some of the things that they don't warn you about when you first get into this job is the thick skin that you have to have. You know, (laughs) they don't warn you about that. They don't tell you about some of the reviews that you're going to have or the emails that you're going to get or the DMs that are going to come in or the reviews that you're going to be tagged in. They don't tell you those kinds of things. Um, You really have to have thick skin in this job. You have to be able to not read the reviews. You have to be able to delete the emails. You have to force yourself not to respond responding is never going to get you anywhere. You don't want an argument. You can't change the way they feel. If they hate it, they're going to hate it. So aside from COVID, I would say that that's been probably the hardest thing to navigate, you know, aside from the business aspect, um, is getting that thick skin. And I feel like I have it now. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not affected. I'm certainly affected. I'm human, but I am not as affected as I used to be. I think I've um, shared on here before. So um, I had a really bad, and so I'm, I'm a pretty happy-go-lucky person, you know, I'm very optimistic. And then when I was living in Edinburgh, I got trolled really, really bad on Goodreads, like hundreds and thousands of people just going through my catalogs one star and telling me how I'm the worst author in the world. And some of them got super personal and it stunted my writing for about a year and a half. I couldn't write. It, it hurt me so deeply and again, I thought that I was rather thick skin at that point in my career. I was probably about six, seven years in. Or well, actually, wow, that's a lie, like four or five. I'm like, how many years has it been? But, you know, you you think you get to a new point and then something like that happens. And it's it's so shocking almost because you think, how is this the world that we live in? Why am I doing this if I'm leaving myself vulnerable to this kind of feedback or attack. So I'm wondering if there has been anything that has really, if you're happy to share, of course, if there has been an experience that really impacted you and took you a little bit to overcome. I think with every book, um, there's moments where the hate becomes a lot, 
especially Mm -hmm. as you get more readers, you know, it comes in thicker. When I released my first book, it took a little while for it to kind of find its footing in the market. Um, Again, we're going back to the heroin addiction. I had a lot of people reach out telling me that I had no right to write a book that was about addiction, that I wasn't qualified, that I couldn't understand. And that was my first book. I didn't have the thick skin that I have now. And so I constantly felt the need to defend myself, you know, people write about everything. You you don't necessarily have to have a master's degree in everything that you write about. I'm no relationship expert. (laughs) I just write romance, you know? So that's how it is in this world. I wrote a book about Alzheimer's disease. I'm not a neurologist. It's just, you know, these are things we pick topics. We do as much research as we possibly can, and we hope to get it right. We have fact checkers. We hope to get the information correct. So there was a lot of hate that came in over that book. Um, There was also a lot of love. So at the time it's hard. Okay. So someone first said to me at the beginning of my career, you will, it's not the five-star reviews that you'll remember. It's the one-star reviews that you'll always remember. And she was a million percent, right? Those emails that I used to get at the very beginning, and I still get them on occasion. um, Those were really hard and it, it messes with your creativity. It doesn't necessarily make you want to keep going. Um, I then wrote after that, I wrote a book, um, that took place in a sex club and they were harvesting organs and it was extremely erotic. And it was my first time doing erotica and it came with a lot of backlash. I, they didn't like how I did the organ harvesting with erotica, that those two elements should have been like kept separate. And so I remember those emails that came in and I thought to myself again, am I cut out for this? Can I handle this? Can I keep going? And those moments, they make you stronger. Now that's not saying that they're easy to overcome. They're miserable. It's not saying that, you know, everyone I know has had moments like that. And I hate that that happened to you. I, my heart breaks. I know exactly what that feels like going on Goodreads. I tell every author just, it, it is a website that we have to just stay far, far, far away from even Amazon. It's sometimes really hard to just, you know, they're critiquing your children and it's, I would never walk in the grocery store and say to a mom, I can't believe that's the way you're parenting your child. But but they, but they give advice on how we parent our children as, as authors, we have kids in their books. And so, you know, it's, it's a really hard balance. <laughs> but then I feel like on the plus side, then you have, you, you sign at book events and then you meet your readers and those who love it, because I can guarantee you that nobody is going to come up to your face and say, I hated your book for these reasons in those because you know everyone's uh what they call them keyboard warriors but then when you go to those events and you get your readers and you think oh my gosh these people have read my books they've connected there is so much love here there's so much friendship and there's so much power in this and I think that kind of connection outweighs like those moments are still shitty but when you have that magical experience that's what outweighs it all I'm about to blow your mind. Um, it, that happened to me actually at a book signing. <laughs> Are you serious? What yeah, a I was a terrible person. <laughs> yeah, it was really horrible. I started crying. I didn't know what to do. I was totally taken back. And I knew her. That's the other thing. She was a friend of a friend. And um, she had read, I knew that she had read one of my books, which is a controversial, I see I write controversial things. And it had a very controversial ending. And, um, but it was sort of semi-based on a true story. So in my mind, the book worked. So, um, she came up to me at a book signing and she put her hands on my table and she leaned forward and she was like, I want to, and she just, she went off on me and she made me feel extremely, extremely uncomfortable. And I just kind of, I'm not confrontational. I, I would rather throw everything under the rug than like face it. And so I just kept sinking into my chair, like lower and lower and lower and just kept listening to her. And then she walked away and I said nothing. And I was like, my husband assists me at all my signings. So like, I just looked at him. I was like, yeah, I have to go to the bathroom. And so I ran up to my room and like fixed my makeup and I'm like, look, I'm here at this. I promised the event leader that I was going to be here. I, this is a, I gave him my obligation. I'm going to put my face on and go back downstairs and finish what I have to do and then go back up to my room and cry. And that's what I did. So 
there, there are some mean people out there. And I think we've all faced them in different ways. It's just how you handle yourself. I certainly wasn't going to yell back. I wasn't going to stick up for myself because it didn't matter what I would say in her eyes, I was wrong. And so it was a, it was a really hard moment and it, it happened in Dallas. It was at a big signing. There was a lot, there was like 2000 people there. This was years ago. I would say this was probably 2017 or 2018, but yeah, that really sucked. <laughs> That's disgusting. The thing though, too, I want to mention here is that reflects far more on that person than you in this situation. And even, and that's terrible that it was in a public place as well, because in a way it's almost, I imagine, not humiliating, but you know, you don't want to be in that situation. You don't want to have that confrontation. And then you're like, what is everyone else thinking, unfortunately, in a situation like that? But they're definitely judging that other person. And I imagine she lost a lot of friends that day. I can't believe. That's so disgusting. I'm actually really flabbergasted. She she lost me. <laughs> I mean, and yeah, she. there were people around my table and I think everyone was just really shocked that she was that aggressive. You know, it was one thing, you know, I've had readers like even in person, they're just like, could that really happen? Like my books are sometimes very out there and and I want them to be, I do this intentionally. And so, you know, we talk about some of my controversial endings. I don't always have the most in certain books of mine. I don't always have the most beautiful HEAs. And so we have conversations and they're honest and they're real. And I love when women are able to get together and just like hash it out in like a constructive, like normal powerful way. And that's what book signings are. It allows you to have that face-to-face -face interaction where you can have the conversation that you can't necessarily have through DM, you know? And so I've had some of the most honest, raw, like cool talks at book signings. They're like my favorite part of this job. But when you have moments where people are just nasty, you know, the keyboard warriors kill me, but that one was like, <laughs> she took it to the next level. And there's a lot of keyboard warriors in this world. So well, I'm sorry that you experienced oh. that. <laughs> I'll, I'll come over, fist to cup. <laughs> Kidding, I'm not a confrontational person either, so I <laughs> would have done the same thing as you did. <laughs> I want to know what is what is the goal, what is the big dream that you are chasing for your career? The bigger the better. Oh, gosh. Well, I'd love to walk to the airport and see my book. I mean, ever, like, I always tell the story, but ever since I was little, I I've always been into traveling. And so like, I have this ritual that every time I go to an airport, I always go, I call them a bookstore. It's like these little convenience stores, like in the airport that sell like the candy and the books and all the things to me, they're bookstores. So like, I always go and I buy a bag of Twizzlers and I go over to where the books are and I check out all the paperbacks and the hardcovers. Like it's my favorite thing every time I'm in any airport. And so like, I've said to my agent, my dream has always been to like get my Twizzlers and go over to where the books are and like see my book. I will die. Like if that happens, I will, I don't think I'll make my plane. Okay. So that's goal number one. And then goal number two would be like a movie or like a mini series or something like that. That would be just so surreal to see, you know, the visual aspect of one of my stories. That would be amazing. Do you think one book or series would be more inclined towards the screen? I do. Um, I have two stories that I feel would be the best fit. And ironically, it's none of my erotic stuff. It's really my angsty, twisty books. Um, when Ashes Fall is is probably one of my most well-known stories. And it, it was inspired by the death of my grandmother, who was like my best friend. And so um, I really feel like that would be probably the best fit for a story because it's just so real and it takes place with real events and you know, part of history and yeah. I have a segment called Speed Dating with an author. So I've lit a candle, I've created an ambience. It's super romantic. But basically it. what it is, is five rapid questions. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right. What is the clumsiest moment you've ever had? Oh gosh. I feel like I have them constantly. You should see my knee right now. It's completely black and blue. It looks like I... I, we we're boaters. We're avid boaters. And we, we have a downstairs for our boat where we sleep. And I was walking down the stairs and I fell face first down and my whole knee is like literally black. So moments like that happen a lot. So I can't even, I can't even say like a normal clumsy moment. I feel like I have them on the daily. So that was this weekend's moment. <laughs> that 
is are you okay <laughs> so, I'm okay it has carpet at the bottom so I was totally fine but my knee hit the air <laughs> what are the three words that best describe you uh oh gosh these are really hard questions yeah. I would say I am very considerate I would say that I am listening I'm always listening to all things um and I know that's probably a weird word to use, but it really describes my personality. Like I am, I hear, I listen to like your aura, the way you, the way you make me feel like I'm just listening. I think I'm kind and I, okay, we'll go with those. <laughs> oh, this is going to be a hard one. What is the song that best describes you? <laughs> I feel like any song that Halsey has ever written probably describes me. I love her. Um, yeah, that's going to be a hard one. I yes, don't know. We can go, we can go with Halsey because I, I also love her. So I'm just like, I'll, I'll allow that just as a <laughs> moving forward. I will allow that. Who has been your favorite character to write and why? I'm going to go with Alex from When Ashes Fall, which is the book that I talked about a few minutes ago. She tested me the most because she has PTSD, which is something I knew nothing about. Um, and the, the mental health that went into that book and the research and the studying and the morphing into that character, um, I, I wept for her, you know, her pain and, and her sorrow, I wept. So she has been the most challenging and the most rewarding for me. Okay. What is a unique talent or skill set that you have that not a lot of people know about? you would think that I'd be prepared with all these answers. And I'm like dumbstruck. I cannot think of a single thing. Um, let's see. I'm extremely organized. I'm very, we'll, we'll go back to the whole structure thing. So not only am I very structured, I'm very organized. So that is probably a skill set. My house looks like um, an HGTV episode where like all my pantries and my closets and like everything is just like, yeah. Um, a skill set though. I, I, I really want to go back to listening because it's something that I feel like that is a skill that a lot of people don't have. And I can recall conversations from years and years ago, which is terrible for my husband because I win every argument, but um, it, it's a trait that I don't find a lot in people. And in fact, in this day and age, I find that most people are horrible listeners. And so I would say that's a skill. Yeah, that's a fantastic skill to have. I have had so much fun today. What do we need to know? What's coming out and where do we find you? Oh gosh, I have so much coming out. So I have The Bachelor coming out April 27th and then I have Dominated, which is coming out June 15th. And then I have my Montlake book, which is called Mr. Hookup. And that is coming out on October 3rd. And then my final book of the year, which is a spinoff series of the Dalton family series, um, that is going to be called the Spade Hotel series and the Playboy, which is book number one is coming out at the very beginning of December. So by the time this airs, all of that will be on pre-order. Oh my gosh. That's incredible. What? So where, where do we find, I think I'm one clicking all of those books. Where do we find you? So my website is marniesman.com. I'm on Facebook, Marnie Midnighters. You can find me on Facebook, just Marnie Man, Instagram, TikTok. Um, I'm in all the places. My books are, some of them are wide and some of them are KU. So I'm literally all over the place. Yeah, amazing. Except for in every organized, structured. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Well, I have had so much fun and who knows, maybe we'll uh, keep an eye out and uh, maybe get you back on next year if you're available. Oh gosh, I would love that. This has been so great. You are so sweet. Thank you so much for having me. So are you. And yeah, thank you for coming on. <laughs> All right. Bye guys. Bye guys.